Hey guys, in today's video, I want to show you the steps I take to sketching this Mexican house front in ink and watercolor. I will also be using my Faber Castell Pit Artist Pens for the shadows, but you can use watercolors or any other markers in shades of gray. We add them on top of the watercolor, so it doesn't matter if they're not waterproof, but perhaps just to be safe, do some tests on how the markers you have work over the top of the watercolor if you haven't tried this out before. So this photo is of a house front in San Miguel de Allende in Mexico. I stayed there for seven or eight months in 2019 and I actually sketched this house front when I was there. So if you have my book, Sketchy Adventures Around the World, you would have seen it. I haven't looked at the sketch for a long time though, so I can't remember how it actually looks. And right at the end of this video, I go and look for my old sketchbook and see how it compares just for fun. So stick around to the end of the video to check that out. As I mentioned in my video about dealing with your inner critic, which you can watch here if you haven't seen it, it's a great way to conquer your head gremlins by looking at older work and seeing how far you've come and that there has in fact been some progression. Right, let's get into the sketching then. So here I just have like a normal B pencil and I'm drawing the big shapes just very lightly. I just want to get the overall rectangle of the building on my page. This photo isn't the best. It's not quite square on and some bits are chopped off. So it's just my photo that I took when I was there. So, you know, this is why sketching on location is always favorable really. But, you know, for this demonstration, this photo or any photo reference you can use, you can use your imagination a little bit to even some things out or add or remove a few things here and there. There's no rules here, guys. We're just practicing and experimenting. So I divide the larger rectangle I've drawn into smaller shapes. I can see that there are three vertical rectangles within my big shape. And then there's a horizontal line which kind of cuts it in half. And I'm just imagining these sections, but you can see where the doors and the windows are and stuff like that. That's how you could divide the larger shape. And it just gives me then some distinct areas into which I can now draw the doors and windows in relation to each other as well. Then I pretty much leave it at that, to be honest, and then I move on to using my pen. When I was a beginner, I would rigorously draw everything in pencil, every little detail, and then I'd do my best to trace over those lines with my pen, and I'd curse myself if my line went wonky and offline with the pencil drawing. And it was just time consuming. And to be honest with you, it wasn't that fun, really. And I, But I just didn't know any other way to do things. And over time, I just realized that it's far better and more fun to just get the very basic lines on the page, just the ones you absolutely need with a pencil, and then get the pen out and go crazy with all the different details and stuff. Your sketch will be far less stiff and you'll have more fun as you're not simply tracing your own pencil lines. It will save you loads of time as well. And as my confidence has grown over the years, I sometimes don't even bother with pencil at all and just go straight in with the pen. I think using a pencil first to get the overall proportions and make sure your subject fits on the page, you know, if that's something that's relevant or important to the thing you're sketching, is still a really great first step. For this ink stage, I'm using my Lamy All-Star fountain pen with an extra fine nib on it, but use whatever you want to. You can use like a 0.1 or a 0.2 fine liner. Um, just remember, whatever you do decide to use, make sure that this pen has waterproof ink in it because we are going to be going over the top of the ink with watercolor. So if you're not sure if your pen's waterproof or not, just get another bit of paper and just test it, um, draw some lines and then try putting some water or some watercolor paint over the top and see if it smudges. And if anyone's curious, I am using an Etcher A5 hot press sketchbook here for no other reason than I have it here and it's landscape orientation so it lends itself quite well to this photograph and to this subject matter. So as I draw in pen I am simplifying some objects and I'm leaving some items out altogether, some intentional, some not intentional, <laughs> I'll get to that later. There's no real rhyme or reason to this, some things I feel may be confusing, other things I just don't feel like drawing. It's all artistic license, you can do whatever you want. 
So once I've drawn the building and key details, I draw the cobbled pavement in front. And if you can get that slight radiation of the lines of the cobbles in, things like that really add a sense of, of realism to the sketch. So even though the sketch is not a realistic drawing and it's not drawn precisely, small things that are important are things like getting that genuine sense of perspective and that can easily be shown by these lines in the pavement. Once I've finished my ink lines, I just go quickly through and erase some of my pencil lines that are peeking through. I drew quite lightly to start with, so I don't have to go too mad. And I'm using a grey kneadable eraser for this, as I feel like they don't damage the surface of the paper like a normal plastic eraser might do. So yeah, just don't erase too hard or too much. Just knock back any of the obvious pencil marks that, you know, might peek through. I'm now moving on to the watercolour stage. I'm using a flat brush for this. Flat brushes are so useful for painting subjects like this where there's so many straight edges. I can't recommend getting one enough if you enjoy sketching and painting architecture. So this particular brush is excellent. It's a half inch Princeton Neptune brush and the handle is actually made out of sea glass, which is quite a cool little touch. And uh, yeah, you can get these from Jackson's Art. I just went to check if they're on Amazon, and they are. I, admittedly, I did just check Amazon UK, uh, but I'm a bit upset to see I paid four times the price for my brush here <laughs> than what is showing on Amazon, but oh well, that's, you know, it is what it is. So I was about to say this is a bit of an expensive brush, but it turns out it's actually not that expensive. So yeah, go grab one there. They're really nice, uh, nice brush. So again, this is the half inch flat or square wash it's called on the, on the brush. I'm starting with the biggest shape and I'm also using one of the lighter colours in the scene. So I'm starting with the yellowy orange, the main colour all over the building. And I personally here am using Daniel Smith New Gamboge and occasionally just sticking a bit of Windsor orange into the mix just to make the, the mix more interesting and not all one colour. I'm just using these colours as they what I have in my set here, but you can use any sort of warm yellowy orange that you have in your set. So as a quick evaluation point, um, I'll, I will sort of evaluate certain bits of the sketch as we're going. I probably could have painted the building less smooth. Um, so, you know, just so I could indicate some of the texture on the wall, or I could have even gone back later on to add a bit of texture. So it's something I'm noticing now I'm looking at things later on in hindsight. I'm thinking of actually doing a video in the near future on how to sort of show texture in watercolour and stuff like that. So let me know in the comments if that's something you are interested in seeing from me. So after I paint in the yellow of the building, I decide to paint in the sky with a cobalt blue. Uh, it's such a nice deep blue in the photo and this contrasts really nicely with the ye yellow orange of the building. So something like a French ultramarine or like a nice uh, warm blue like that would look really, really good. And then I decide to do all the bits I can see that are in this sort of nice warm reddish brown. I'm using uh, something called brick brown from the Etcher set, but something like a burnt sienna would work, whatever, again, whatever you've got in your set. And, um, or you can just like mix a bit of brown and a warm red together and sort of see what you get. It's always useful to have a bit of scrap paper to like a bit of scrap watercolor paper to the side of your sketch, just to test some of your mixes on. I then get a more sort of straight up brownie brown. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the technical term, uh, for the other doors. I mean, the exact colors I'm using in the sketch aren't really that important. Just use your own judgment and work with the pigments that you actually have in your set. I find uh, a helpful way to think about color is by asking myself to start with, is it a warm color or is it a cold color? So as an example, let's just take the yellow of the building. Is it a cold yellow? Is it one that may lean to green on the color wheel? Or is it a warm yellow, one that leans more towards orange on the color wheel? And in this instance, I think we can quite clearly see that it's more orangey and therefore it's a warm yellow. With browns, again, they may be a warmer brown and they might lean more towards the red on the color wheel, or they might be cooler and have a bit more blue in them, which means they're kind of a bit darker or a bit grayer. The blue 
kind of neutralizes the brown. And any of us know um, our sort of color mixing and watercolor. A lot of the times artists will mix a blue and a brown together to make a, a nice sort of almost black color as it's just more interesting than using black straight from a straight from the pan so yeah that's something to that's that's a way i and i start to think about color that really helps me kind of try and identify what i'm looking at seeing different swatches like this uh, laid out like this can really help you understand colors and color theory better so i highly recommend having something like this in front of you when you're painting Okay, so I do the door frames and balconies in uh, a color called English Red. I know this is the color that I want for this sketch. Again, it's in my set, but it's um, definitely more of a red than a brown color. And you can see I paint in some of the frames roughly because in the photo they're kind of quite worn. So I have a slightly dry brush to do that. So here I am remembering to put in a bit of texture on those uh, door frames. And then after this, I switch to a smaller brush with a point to do the smaller details. In this case, I'm using a Rosemary & Co quarter inch dagger brush. As most of you know, it's a brush I couldn't live without. And I do actually have the slightly larger half inch dagger brush, which is not the travel brush. And I don't find I reach for that one much at all. So definitely this quarter inch travel brush is the one is the one for me. So when it comes to painting in the foliage, I never try to follow the pen lines I've put down. I just put my own impression of the plant shapes down with the brush. And this really leads to a nice loose look. There's nothing saying that your paint has to go inside your, your ink lines. <laughs> So I really like to put down sort of a strong yellowy green first and then wet in wet I add a very strong dark green at the base of the plant to indicate a bit of shadow and I just find this little shortcut of painting foliage is just really handy and it always looks good. It's always a nice contrasty look. So I switch back to the flat brush to paint the pavement in, the, the street in, and I like to use a bit of Payne's Grey with just a touch of quinadricone rose dotted in here and there just to give a bit of visual interest again so it's not all one kind of flat colour. And then I just add in some neutral shades in the windows and a bit of a dark brown for the roof edge which I haven't done particularly neatly but that's fine, it doesn't matter. And all in all this watercolour stage is done. Now it's easy to be disheartened at this stage and feel a bit uninspired because you feel like you've done most of the work but your sketch looks kind of flat and boring and a lot of people will even stop at this stage but there is still more work to be done and these following stages are where things really start to come to life. This is where the magic is. So I just want to mention quickly, guys, if you want weekly demos from me and some serious dose of inspiration, then do go over and check out Patreon. I am almost certain it will improve your sketching skills and also just widen your horizons. So the subscription is monthly, which you can cancel at any time and the link is in the video description below. So I'd really appreciate if you go and check that out when you get a moment. So my next step is to get my black brush pen out and add any areas of black, but there's not much here to be honest, just a window over on the left and a couple of boxes. I don't do this step in every sketch, but sometimes there are bits where I just wanna add in like total black for maximum contrast. And then the next step in my personal sketching process is to crack out my Faber-Castell Pit Artist pens. Now, you don't need to have these exact pens. You can use any other grey markers. Just make sure you test them out first. Or you can totally do this stage in watercolour. I just like the Pit Artist pens as I can be a bit more precise with them. And to be honest, it's just easier and... <laughs> Oh, I'm just being lazy really, but there are some areas on this sketch where I do wish I had used watercolor instead, but I'm trying this out on camera and sometimes thing, things work and sometimes they don't. Sometimes I intend to do certain things and then I don't end up doing them. But, you know, I'll know for next time to follow my instinct that some of these shadow areas would probably have looked better if I'd done them in watercolor. And I'll point this out as we progress through the rest of the sketch. I start by adding any sharp lines of shadows, so by the side of the door frames or underneath some window frames, things like that. I have three warm greys here and three cold greys. People tend to ask me how to know which one to use. In this example, I'm using the mid 
warm grey as a shadow because the shadow is being cast by a red window frame onto a warm yellow building. So in my opinion, this means I should use a warm grey as the, the shadow with this particular technique. Now, what am I basing this on? My experience rather than theory. So I could be wrong here, but it makes sense to me uh, with this particular set of pens to be using the warm grey here. So can you see what a difference just adding these small shadows is already making to this scene? It's just bringing a bit more dimension to things. So I work my way around the sketch, just adding the small shadows first. Some of the pipes I'm colouring in with one of the cold grey markers, as I realised I didn't paint them in. I then decide to add the shadows for the pipes, and I realise I did miss one of the pipes out in my drawing, but that's okay. I also realised what I thought was a satellite dish on top of the roof is not at all a satellite dish, and in fact, it's the underside of a street lamp that's coming off one of the posts on the front of the house. So I don't know how I got that wrong. I've only just noticed that. But again, sometimes this is the issue with using photos and you can't quite see what's going on and sometimes you have to make things up. Also that and dodgy eyesight. <laughs> so after this, I decided just to go for it and do the shadows underneath some of the roof areas, like over the doors and stuff and the balconies with the pit artist pens. And Initially, I had intended to do this in watercolour, and I kind of wish I had. I think the pens work okay for some areas, but not all areas. Because the pens are translucent, if you colour a large area, you can see the streaks where the marks have um, layered over each other. So that's not always the best look, especially when you want like an even shadow kind of colour. But that's okay. I mean, it's not awful. It's just an evaluation point. <laughs> In some areas I left a few gaps between strokes actually and it indicates light is sneaking through some of those tiles and I thought that was quite a nice effect. Not something I'd massively intended but it was quite a nice sort of little accident. And I used my lightest warm grey marker to put in the shadows of cables which are probably coming from the overhead cables opposite the building um, that are being cast on the front of this house. And adding these small details really start bringing this sketch to life. I then get a thicker pen, in this case a 0.3 fine liner, and I start moving around adding thicker lines in areas such as edges that are casting a shadow like on the left of some of the door frames, sorry on the right hand side of some of the door frames, and this really adds some nice dimension. I also thicken up some of the metal railings in front of the windows on the balconies and stuff like that. And from here on in, guys, it's just tootling around, just adding anything of mist, such as shadows or some thicker lines, stepping back, seeing if anything looks unfinished. And the very last thing I decide to do is just to add some grey into some of the cobbles to give them some variation. Again, this is such a small detail, but I think it really adds quite a lot more life to the sketch. And there we go, that's pretty much it. So my main evaluation points from this sketch are I missed getting some of the texture on the wall, which I really think would have added more interest to the sketch, uh, told more of a story. I think next time I would do the larger shadow areas in watercolour rather than the pit artist pens, just to avoid the, the, those streaky lines. And then I think I just want to concentrate a tiny bit harder on some of the details, like I missed out a pipe, which would have been cool to include, and I got the satellite dish wrong. But to be honest, that's that's nitpicking. That doesn't matter too much. And other than that, you know, I, I quite like this sketch. And just for th fun, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I thought I'd go and find my sketch from back in 2019 to see how it compares. I couldn't remember at all what it looked like. So here it is. So yeah, this is interesting. I've drawn it so much smaller and really simplified it. Look, I got this street lamp thing correct in this in this first one here, but I got quite a lot of other major things totally wrong. So look at where I've placed some of the doors and the windows. It's just totally off. Um, and then I just made up a window over here on the right-hand side. <laughs> As you can see, I uh, don't really have the grasp of adding shadows and depth here in this sketch yet, um, but I, I actually quite li like how clean the sketch is, so I've definitely simplified it and I, I quite like it. Anyway, on that note, I hope this was a useful process video for you. If you want weekly demos and experiments from me, do go over and check out Patreon. The link is in the description below. 
Also, if you want several hours of real-time, step-by-step instruction on how to produce quirky ink and watercolour sketches of your travels, check out my online course Sketch Your Adventures, now available on demand. It used to only open once or twice a year, but now you can get it at any time. So again, the link is in the description below. And otherwise, guys, I will see you in another video.